Recently, one of my videos on German grenades was picked up by the YouTube algorithm and experienced an incredible influx of views. The success of this video and the amount of people who requested that I make another video on grenades got me thinking. What is a grenade-related topic that everyone would find interesting? I also realized that it had been quite a while since I made anything on the American Civil War, so I feel that it is appropriate to make a video on Civil War grenades. Now, grenades go way back. The earliest versions were ceramic or cast iron shells filled with black powder and fitted with a burning fuse. These obviously have a huge drawback, the fuse. First, you would have to find an open flame near you to light it. Once lit, you needed to get rid of it quickly. Finding a replacement for this burning fuse is the challenge that grenade designers faced, and today we are going to take a look at two of the Civil War era solutions. Up first, we have the Haynes Excelsior Grenade. This design was patented on August 26, 1862 by A. W. W. Haynes. It consisted of three parts, the grenade itself and a cast iron container made up of two halves. You can see the grenade's name cast into the side of the outer shell. The function of this grenade was quite simple. It had 12 to 14 nipples upon which percussion caps would be placed. The grenade, now armed, would be put back into the cast iron container. It was set off by one of the percussion caps striking the inside of the container. The strategically placed percussion caps ensured that the grenade would detonate no matter how it landed. So far there is no evidence that these actually saw combat. The drawbacks and dangers of such a design are obvious. Now I wasn't able to find a whole lot more information than that in my research, but then I remembered that I could search the patent date. So I did, and here it is. I've never seen this patent referenced in any of the articles or blog posts about this grenade, so to some extent this is new information. And there are some interesting bits in here. First of all, you can see that what he was patenting was basically a fusing system for artillery shells. In fact, the patent description only mentions grenades once as an alternative use for the system. His artillery shell functioned identically to the grenade. Upon hitting a target, an intersection would be forced against the inside of the outer shell, setting off the percussion caps and detonating the shell. Figures 1 and 5 are both intended for use in rifled guns. On both of the rifled shells, you can see a piece marked C. This was described as a cushion to prevent the inner shell from moving until it struck the target, which would have enough force to overcome the cushion. Now, figures 3 and 4 show the combination grenade and smoothbore shell. I'm not sure how this would have worked in a smoothbore, and Haynes doesn't seem to either. He kind of glosses over that in his description. It is obvious, however, that he built his grenades based off this part of the patent. I'm not sure what became of his other shell designs. I've never seen any prototypes or recovered examples. Next up, we have the Ketchum Grenade. This design is a little more well-known and was actually used in combat. Like the Excelsior, it used an impact detonation system, but it functioned in a different way. It was patented by William F. Ketchum on August 20th, 1861, a full year before the Excelsior. The grenade was to be thrown in the same manner as you would throw a dart. The wooden paper tail ensured that the correct end would always hit the ground first. The detonator mechanism was very simple. On one end of the grenade, a small tube was fitted that extended into the powder cavity. At the end of this tube was a nipple upon which a percussion cap was placed. Next, a plunger was inserted that extended out of the tube. Upon contact with the ground, the plunger would be forced further into the tube, setting off the percussion cap and detonating the grenade. Now, quite a few of these were manufactured. I've seen one source stating that over 93,000 were made. They were available in one, three, and five pound versions. The Ketchum saw documented action at Petersburg, Port Hudson, and Vicksburg. The most famous story involving these grenades came from Port Hudson and was recorded by a Lieutenant Wright. He wrote, The enemy had come this time prepared with hand grenades to throw into our works from the outside. When these novel missiles commenced falling among the Arkansas troops, they did not know what to make of them, and the first few which they caught, not having burst, they threw them back upon the enemy in the ditch. This time many of them exploded and their character was at once revealed to our men. Always equal to any emergency, they quickly devised a scheme. Spreading blankets behind the parapet, the grenades fell harmlessly into them, whereupon our boys would pick them up and hurling them with much greater force down the moat, they would almost invariably explode. Now of the two designs, the Ketchum is obviously superior. And while it had its drawbacks, mainly in the safety department, it was the best that was available at the time. And to put something else into perspective, it would only be 57 years after the introduction of the Ketchum until the ubiquitous Mark II was introduced. Anyways, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching and consider subscribing if you'd like to see more videos about Militaria and military history. Thank you.